would Katerina please come up and show up? So we, we're very fortunate to have two volunteers to be embarrassed. Um, so who, who thinks their hand hygiene is really fantastic? Their technique's really great. Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. So you might think it's fantastic, but why are people getting sick? So while I'm chatting about what we're going to do next, please take off all your jewellery, your watch, and roll your sleeves up to the elbow, please. Okay, so Katharina and Schwab have actually used a special um, glow lotion. And they're going to wash their hands with uh, water, just water for 20 seconds, and soap and water for 20 seconds. The lesson of this is, is how important a surfactant is, soap is. So please go and do that, and wash and wipe your hands with, uh, with the towel. Now you all have the alcohol-based hand drop, either the big one in front of you or the little one, and if you don't have a little one, they're, they're taking home, so please, um, you all need one. Love alcohol, yeah. it's going to save your life. Okay. So, you'll have all seen, you'll have all seen the WHO technique, the seven poses. Um, on your table, I've given you two types of hand hygiene poses. Um, the, it says here for lotion, soap and water. You can use it for alcohol-based hand rub. And the reason I've given this one is the other ones didn't have the seventh step, and that is to do your wrist. So we're going to go through this, and you're all going to practice, and you're going to get a buddy system. You have to cover seven areas. Now, WHO have developed a dance and etc. Uh, as very cute, but I don't, we don't care which order you do it in necessarily. But what you have to do is cover your hands. Now, um, if we're going to go through this one. And this is the one with uh, something like like this. Okay, so um, Margie will Margie will demonstrate. We need to get it under our nails. That, that that's why we're not doing palms first. Get it under your nails first because that's where a lot of the bugs are. Okay, so she's so she's nails, nails. pushed her nails in and then she's dragged some of it to the other hand to then roll your nails underneath. Yeah, and don't forget your monkey grip for all the cuticle around the back there. Then the only way I know to do it, and I can actually give a lecture while I've done it, because I do it so regularly, the same, that I never miss a part, is you can do your five by five, then your webs, then you go to the back of your dominant hand, a non-dominant hand, then you go to the back of your dominant hand. People one, often forget that one. One second. WHO says to go at the back of your hand through your webs. Now what is happening in um, something like a bowler is you've missed the top of your fingers. So we've not modified it to go top of fingers, then, then open up your fingers, and do the same on the other hand as well, and then open your fingers, okay? And then never forget your thumbs. Quite often people see me coming and want to do it, uh, they're doing an audit, they're rubbing really hard, but they forget to do the back of their dominant hand and their thumbs, so your thumbs, and then your wrists, and you must do all of those every time. Now, if you don't have a ritual, what you do exactly every time, you'll forget one when you get distracted. Can I go and practice this from now and forever? So you do your non-dominant hand normally first and then your dominant hand. And uh, what the problem with that is, is that your dominant hand does all the work and by the time your non-dominant hand go goes to clean your dominant hand, it doesn't do it nearly as well. So please be very mindful of your dominant hand that it gets a cover. Yeah, because that's okay. what you're contaminating the most. Now, the one reason why we emphasise nails, you can fit 150 million E. coli onto a one millimetre pinhead. That's why your rings have to come off. Imagine how many bugs can get caught under those rings and in your watches that you are choosing to take home with you. But you can get from half a billion to a billion viruses on a one millimetre pinhead. You must think microscopic when you come to bugs and viruses. Okay? Really small. Okay. Turn the lights on. All right, so okay. um, maybe just over here. We're going to try and see how well the hand hygiene's gone. Now let's see if we can see any. You can look up around. Oh, now look at her, her around her cuticles, around Katarina's cuticles. 
is white, a white lotion. So you didn't do so well there. <laughs> <laughs> Just water, I must say. Okay. All right. Yeah. So yes. um, yes. sometimes when we do this, it goes all the way up the arm. And it just goes to show you that when you're working with Ebola, it doesn't matter what CDC says, aerosolization of feces and blood can contaminate the environment and contaminate your PPE, okay? So be very mindful that you go just about everywhere. So yes, your cuticles are appalling. <laughs> so, oh, cuticles, not so good either. Not so good either. No. We but we didn't teach them, so they're okay. allowed to have it wrong. So, yeah, so come and have a look, cuticles. We uh, sent them out while well, I taught you the seven steps. So, <laughs> yes. Come <laughs> here, now this is what we want to remember, wherever you have that left on your hands, you can actually take it home with you, oh dear, I'm a bit tired now, or, oh, do you have some place for reading on that computer there? Oh, now look at this, we've got two. 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 Okay, all right, so let's turn the light back on. So, um, Reiner keeps a very tight ship when it comes to time. Um, so we'll try uh, and practice one more time and I want you to turn to a buddy and watch each yeah. other and if you oh, forget the you steps, go. I'm going to... Now, we cut and pasted this in the order that we think it should be. Okay, so you can watch this one or you can do the other one. As long as you cover your cuticles. Go like this, then this, open up your hands, on the other side, then open up your fingers, then your thumb, and don't forget the tip. I'm always very bad at the thumb. Then this, then see I've run out already, and mine's dry already. So, yep, and then drag it over. One, two, three, four, five. 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 So I can do it. I have enough if I do it for five. Yeah. Okay. But any more or any slower, it dries down. And then you have to wait till it dries. My good friend, Dr. Craig Bootless, who's an infectious disease doctor, picked me up on missing one part. So if you go out, you'll be able to do it. He was right. He said, Margie, show me how you do it again. He said, that part of your thumb. He said, I thought I was perfect, but I missed that part of my thumb too. His solution, which is right, is instead of going straight to your back of your hands like that, do it with a side way and do down the side of your thumb. And then, you know, so you're doing it that way and looking up. Otherwise, it's just one part there that doesn't quite fit under. And, you know, if you're playing with significant bugs, you can't afford to miss, yep? Yeah? You could just be reflecting that you keep missing the other side. Yes. You do. Yes. Your so dominant hand wants to do all the work. Getting that way now. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so this is a classic, and if you go onto the web, you can find many of these that show the same spot of weakness. So this is your dominant hand, your thumb. I always miss my thumb. Your cuticles are, are a red hot spot, and that's where you're going to be putting them to your face, uh, putting them to your eyes, okay? So it's very important to reduce your risk of infection. So just while we wait for uh, our colleagues to come back, uh, who has not heard of the five moments for hand hygiene? Okay, so you've probably heard of them, but you may be a bit confused about them because they are quite tricky. But Margie and I have reduced it to the thought of you cleaning into your gloves, you clean out of your gloves. You clean into the room, you clean out of the room. You clean into an aseptic technique, you clean out of an aseptic technique. You clean into, um, you know, whatever you happen to be cleaning into, okay? So these five moments pertain to, and we always teach hand hygiene to look after the patient. But in this particular aspect, we're looking after you. So we flip the coin, because we always talk about the patient, but we're worried about you during Ebola. So the patient will, I'm sure, not pick up another hospital-acquired infection if you do this as well. <laughs> Nevertheless, uh, uh, you know, we're, we're here for you. 
So you, you clean before, and you can clean while you're walking towards the patient. This should be, alcohol-based hand rub should be at point of care, no further than point of care. That is the definition of an arm's length. So you're cleaning towards the patient. Even if you touch just the patient's bedding, you have to clean in and then you clean out. And that's called moment four, after you've touched the patient. But moment five, I think will be very underestimated and very important in Ebola. You're cleaning out of the patient's zone. So particularly patients who are wet patients, wet Ebola patients, they've got diarrhea, they've got vomiting. Uh, they're the patients that can contaminate the environment uh, and this is where you really, really need to do your moment five. Well, my fear for moment five, gee, my glove is torn, I'll go over to the trolley and get a new one and you take it off, you go, go to the box and you contaminate the whole box with Ebola. So before you go and pick up equipment, you must make sure you clean it. Don't contaminate your... So, the five moments, you understand them, even if the patient is sitting in a chair, it's still five moments. And for you, moment five is so important, and moment one, of course, is important for the patient. But just keep thinking. You have to do these moments even when you're caring for an Ebola patient. Okay, so you've seen this before. Um, but the thing that we love about this is that it talks about hand hygiene constantly all the way through. Every time you take an item off. Now, this is only a few days old because previously Ryan has shown you some of the uh, doffing that didn't include covering of the hair and didn't include hand hygiene between each step and now it does. Now for this uh, person they're using 0.5 uh, bleach, 0.5%. In the community uh, in Liberia where we have a, I have a PhD student, they're doing 0.05 but here when you're looking after patients it'll be 0.5. Okay, so we've got another experiment. Could we? Let's turn the lights off. Um, while we were going around, uh, supposedly giving you um, these uh, printouts for how well you were, you know, how to do your hand hygiene, we were dusting the environment as well with a plastic fluoride particle, so that we could see how this is spread onto you. I'm sure that Ryan is keeping tabs on me for time. Okay, so what have we learnt? What have we learnt? Well, we've learnt that over on this table... Hi, guys. Just a second. I'm sorry I don't have a, a loudspeaker, so if you wouldn't mind. So what we've learnt is that people touch their face without even knowing it. And we've done a little study uh, looking at people ha touching their faces, and it'll come out in the... Um, uh, American Journal of Infection Control soon. So that you touch your eyes about three times an hour, you know, on average. Your nose three times <coughs> per hour on average. Your mouth four times. Chin four, ears once, neck once. Not so great, not so problematic if it's just for a, you know, a staff and probably a third of you already have it. But if you're talking about Ebola and your doffing, your buddy has to remind you constantly not to touch your face. One of the best rules, do hand hygiene. Whenever you go to take anything off from your face, your hands are going up near your face, do hand hygiene so nothing falls in. Okay, so um, Katarina allowed me to use this slide uh, because I think it really um, emphasises this. She says, so this is Sue Ellen Kovac, uh, the Australian Red Cross nurse. No foods allowed in the low risk area. It's too risky to put anything near your mouth from your hands. But I still see people biting their nails, touching their face, as we've seen, rubbing their eyes, risky, but automatic response. And it's just human. You ha your hands have been washed a trillion times with chlorine, but still you don't know how safe your other colleagues have been. They may have contaminated the environment, even in the low risk environment as well. You are literally entrusting your life to your workmates. Before I left Australia, I took to wearing a rubber band each time caught myself and she would snap it. So be mindful, very mindful of where your hands are traveling. So what's wrong with this? And this is a person that's completely um, uh, donned and that I've put this person in the wet zone. They're in the Ebola wet zone. What's wrong with this picture? Yeah. So hands. 
When you get in there and you put your equipment on, as Katerina tells you to put the equipment on, do not touch it, do not adjust it, and don't touch your mouth as well. Um, and you've got to practice, uh, hopefully your name will be on something so people will know who you are, <coughs> but you have to practice being able to understand and talk to people through the mask because our, our PhD student who's over in Liberia says that she often saw somebody take their N95 and put it on top of their head to have a chat. So please don't do that. It's just normal. That's yeah, human you nature. Asked someone that from the Ministry of Health said, ask everybody why they step off the plane with a mask. And as soon as we said that, I walked up to them and asked them a question. They put their hand on the outside of the mask and put it up and said, what did you say? <laughs> Chinese this during the start. So yeah, it's, it's just be careful of those things. Yes, it's, it's natural instinct, you know? So, um, if you're going to wash your gloves, um, CDC recommends using alcohol-based hand wipe on the gloves between each patient and between each of five moments. You don't take your gloves off. Um, if, you're wearing, if you're using 0.5% bleach instead of alcohol-based hand wipes uh, because you're in Africa, then remember the bleach, as Katerina has already mentioned, can um, affect the uh, integrity of the glove. So regularly check the ability. Now, Shawab has gone through where you can find the virus, and this is just to remind you that it can be found in nearly everything. Um, it can be found on stained gloves, um, intravenous, um, IV sets, uh, tears and skin. Strangely enough, they didn't uh, find it in urine, but that's because it was a small study. The Emory Hospital has found it in urine and skin and vomit as well. And when the patient vomits or has diarrhea, it can be uh, very watery, very explosive, and it can contaminate the environment, and that's your environment. WHO also says it's now in vomit, and maybe they saliva also and tears. They add sweat into this one. They don't yeah. say it's in there, but they've, in standard precautions, we say all body substances are potentially infectious except sweat. Who have not? They've included sweat as a potential one. Okay, so um, remember, it can get directly into your eyes and mouth, but indirectly through your hands. So CDC talk about direct um, contamination, but we're here today to remind you that indirectly through your hands is, is really important. It's an unappreciated, I think, um, issue. So you can contaminate your hair with blood or vomit, or even, as Katerina said, as you're taking um, the, the uh, mask off. Uh, now, what I did see... No, so it's not, it's not me. not wearing hair nets. I mean, I saw some of those pictures. You actually do cover your... your they do. You That's your right. Off. They should. But don't forget, if you uh, contaminate your... As you're taking it off... And you're, and you're doffing, we call it doffing, you might contaminate your hair if you don't do it well. So I did see one of the uh, online uh, videos uh, from Africa where people are washing their hands with 0.5% bleach, then they go through and wash their hands uh, with water, then they put their water to their face and wash, oh, thanks, and wash their face. Um, please don't do that. Please do not wash your face like that. Um, I know that they probably don't have uh, alcohol wipes in Africa. If you go to Africa, then get even uh, a piece of uh, paper towel and do it with a paper towel. Do not drag it into your mouth, okay? So um, uh, Katerina mentioned uh, if you're, you know, there, there are lots of areas that can enter and uh, including, you know, uh, shaving your legs, cutting your face when you shave, uh, even insect bites, and if you've got dermatitis, just don't go in to care for patients. Do something else, and that's why you're gowned up from head to gown to, to foot. The unappreciated areas are the surfaces that we believe have been aerosolized, contaminated uh, by vomiters and blood, uh, and it can remain uh, in an active form for six days in the right environment. It certainly likes darkness and it certainly likes lower temperatures, but in the right environment it can survive for up to six days. 
lower, yes. like to lower four temperatures. Degrees, yes. Like yes. Fridge temperature, that's yes. contaminated specimens in the fridge. Yes. And uh, uh, so my student Sharon Salmon was saying that when she's out there looking after the uh, community, and she teaches people to put gloves on their hands and gloves on their feet, uh, not gloves, sorry, plastic bags on their hands <coughs> and on their head and on their feet. Um, you go into the huts and there, there's been a dead body there for many, many days because sometimes they're too, <coughs> too slow in picking up the dead bodies. Uh, the, the huts have um, dirt floors, so be mindful that that is contaminated. Okay, so how can it be deactivated? Um, easily, alcohol, bleach, 0.5% for any non-porous surface. And I think Shawab talked about um, uh, you know, moving in, or maybe it was Katarina, moving in and out of low re uh, risk areas. There should not be porous um, materials, but there are in high in Western countries such as uh, sheets, and of course those have to be um, incinerated. Uh, but uh, I'll show you something in a moment where there's a, a, a privacy screen, and of course it's linen. Uh, it should be plastic if you're going to have many people in the room. Um, and uh, we'll, we talk about EPA, and, and that stands for Environmental Protection Agency. It's the US standard for hospital-grade um, uh, disinfectant. And we use a similar hospital-grade. Um, it, it is uh, deactivated with heat, boiling, autoclaving, and incinerating. And you can... Um, wash the sheets if you really want to, but the problem is it increases the risk for the healthcare worker or the, or the laundry staff. Um, it can be uh, killed with um, gamma radiation and uh, UV light. And here we see a lovely picture of boots that have been decontaminated. First of all, uh, unlike the platform that they walk on in the US that Katarina showed you, in Africa they walk into a tray of bleach. You have to stand there for 10 minutes and while you're standing there your buddy is checking uh, for any breaches of your um, PPE and uh, then they're dried and of course the UV helps as well. And as you can notice, <coughs> the rubber gloves for cleaning have been um, uh, re redone. Now, we don't have much time because there are many other people. So I just want to remind you that when you're going, when you're taking, you, oh, where, we, where we take equipment in, we're taking equipment from a clean field into a dirty field. And think of yourself as like theatre staff. So when you take it into the dirty field, it should not come back out, so unless it comes through a waste bin. And that waste bin needs to be rigid and non-leak proof, and preferably in a frame that has a lid on it. Because when somebody goes to move that, you don't want it to um, leak everywhere and contaminate. Uh, do not take notes in from uh, into the clean field from the dirty field. You shouldn't probably take medical notes and nursing notes in. If you do, they have to be incinerated afterwards. You can't take them back out. Trays, use trays and dishes moved directly from point of care from the, from the patient into a receptacle. And uh, CDC believes that this is now ha hazardous material. Okay, so um, these, this is a lovely uh, picture. Um, this is uh, probably a uh, community uh, Ebola treatment unit where Sharon tells me that uh, a lot of the Ebola patients, uh, the numbers have been underestimated because patients get sent away, they either go home to die or, be, or fortunately survive, um, as Katerina has shown you, a whole family survived, or they go to a school or um, a sporting arena where they set these ones up and they're usually not as good looking as this. But what are we seeing here? We're seeing an environment that you can't easily de decontaminate. So you need to be mindful what you're working in. You're working in an area that is potentially full of virus, okay? So problematic. Unsealed wood is always a risk. Yeah. Bugs can survive and if it's varnished or painted with, sealed with gloss paint, you've got a much better hope. But unsealed wood is a real worry. Don't put your kidney dish down on there and think it's safe. Be careful. So this is lovely. Um, uh, Margie, you probably enjoy talking about this one. So this is okay. a wet 
what I call it a wet of all the patients, so the ones that have diarrhoea. I like that. When I started teaching it to the staff, they understood that wet, and there was a whole lot of fluid around, and please be very, very, very careful. This one is where we have to concept. We are used to, as healthcare workers, having aprons on and knowing this is the dirty section, this is where we have it. But you're going into this environment, and suddenly our really exposed environments are our legs. And so truly you do have to come back to think, are you shaving those legs, do you have <coughs> insect bites, have you scratched it or whatever? Because there are a heck of a lot more risks than we're used to thinking about when that. The good part about that though, when a patient is down and vomiting, there's less risk of you when you're standing up of, of getting it, but compared to as if they were much closer to your face. That's one plus, but remember that's a huge risk. The other one is, because I work in a hospital and I look at the state of mattresses, these can tear. And I've found a mattress before with plenty of blood and lycor tucked in there. So be careful and observe for rips and know that if there's a rip, that's a beautiful foam that's going to grow bugs in there beautifully. So look for the risks in your environment. So in the US or Australia, we would uh, incinerate these. Mm -hmm. Can they get reused? So when Maggie talks about, you know, have you got cuts on your legs, have you shaved your legs, don't shave your leg while you're in Africa. Because if you do I have... Gonna ask that. Okay. Yeah, don't. With razors. Uh, okay. yeah. Keep razors away. Yes. Yeah, so, uh, so if you're down there, you'll have your legs covered. But if there's a breach in your PPE, then you're at risk. Now, it's unlikely. Or contaminated removing your PPE. Yeah. It's unlikely, yeah. but we're here to make sure that likely is never, never happens. Yeah. The same line, what's a bigger risk for a male um, shaving or not shaving? Um, well, I, I've asked a few guys and they tell me electric shave is fine, but whether you have electricity in these places. Yes. But if you're using, Craig, a, a, a razor, it would be a risk. Um, yeah, it's a catch-22. Like yeah. You need to not have a beard for a yeah. right. wearing your mask yeah. anyway. So yeah, yeah. Have that's true. Yeah. 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 yeah, But a razor is a, a... Be very careful with a razor. I think okay. it, so the most obvious thing would be a battery-powered electric shaver. Yeah, no, that's a good idea. So a battery-powered battery shaver. Yeah. Okay. But so I still cut myself with that. You just have to be aware of what yeah. you're doing. Yeah. So here we have, um, I initially called it, but I took it away, a dry bowler zone, but it may not be. Um, but here we have the risk of the privacy screen, uh, that should be plastic, um, and linen on the, on the bed. And uh, remember, uh, you're now not just healthcare workers, but you're cleaners as well. So mm -hmm. CDC recommend, and quite rightly, that while you're in the rooms, you clean up the mess, okay, so that we reduce the risk to um, the non-clinical staff. So WHO talks about, so think about this, it's EPA hospital grade bleach in Australia or America, or it's bleach 0.5% for anything that doesn't corrode and for non-porous areas. Uh, and it's great for cleaning up body fluids, the floors, the mattress, and your footwear. Um, if we're to, and you will use that on the outside of your gloves. If you're in Africa, after you take the last pair of gloves off, you will use this very strong amount on your hands first and then wash. But in Australia, you'll use alcohol-based hand rub. And that's why you need to really know how to use it well. Um, the 0.05% is for more in the community, but also for thermometers, uh, your laundry, your plates, etc. Um, now, remember, bleach requires 10 minutes to work. So when they tell you, and Katerina mentioned feces, so you're going to take out the excrement somewhere, and uh, in Australia, the US, Africa, they have look in Africa they have latrines in the room, as the map showed. Now here we will have patients with an ensuite bathroom. They talk about putting bleach on top of the feces, but bleach will not work getting through all that organic material. So I think that's a fairly a waste of time. I'm not sure why they bother putting that step in really, maybe to make you feel comfortable. But yep. certainly the bleach yeah. after you take the feces out and yep. put it down the toilet. The other thing about bleach, it has a very short half-life and it's light sensitive. It breaks down in light. So you can't yes. make it up and leave it there for a few days. You know, and, and out in the light, it breaks down its ability to kill bacteria breaks yes. and that. So you make it every day and uh, and it gets contaminated as well. That's remember Milton for those mums that had the mm. bottles and Milton's why we had to do that. Okay, so Katarina's always mentioned already mentioned don't touch <coughs> the door handle. If you've got if you can if it's got a handle, not a push, 
get your buddy on the other side to open up and you should not have your patient in a room that you don't have a glass in the door. Um, and on exiting uh, the ante room, uh, the first action should be if you uh, don't have a mat or you know if you, if you, a basin of bleach, uh, certainly in Africa, but here it might be directly on a mat. But if you go into an ante room and you're going to, to remove DOF, you're going to have to make sure that you keep one area dirty and one area clean, okay? Um, standing in the bleach, uh, you can get your buddy to, to check you in Africa, um, or while you're standing on the mat, you have somebody to help you take your gear off. You should not do it by yourself ever. And they should check to see whether or not you've got any breaches. And what they'll do is, unless you're wearing your, your plastic hood, your pepper hood, etc., they won't spray you down. They'll wipe you down with alcohol-based hand uh, wipes um, uh, and or an EPA detergent, um, bleach, sorry, to remove any blood or, or fluids. <coughs> You've got a couple of questions. Oh, yeah. So we talked a few times about having assistance in doffing, but yeah. how does your buddy get their gear on? Well, they don't have much gear on. They have gloves yeah. on and, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. The doffer shouldn't assist you taking things off. You do that yourself, but he's assisting by saying what to do, but not touching you. Yes. Yeah. 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 The 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 CDC, yeah. yeah, the last so CDC, yeah. CDC does so say... No, yeah. the last so CDC the does the say use a doctor, so there's the conflicting information yeah. coming out. Yeah, yeah. but the doctor's not supposed to touch No, yeah. doctors yeah. Don't, don't touch, no. Yeah. So they might have gloves if they have to help you, um, or wipe you down. Well, but, that's, but that's the question. So that's the issue. If, if, if your buddy is wearing PPE to assist you, how do they get their PPE on? Um, actually, that's a very interesting question, because the CDC guidelines do not identify what gear a, uh, a doffing buddy should do. Uh, now, sometimes a doffing buddy can be on the other side of glass, so to yeah, sort of yeah, help so we, we call that person a trained observer, yeah. just to yeah. differentiate. Yeah, so there is the, both, and if you look at the latest Medicine Sun Frontiers, the ones that came out on that, they actually do have their doffer uh, assistants actually all kitted up, spraying them over, not wiping, but spraying, not touching. So so how do they get their gear off? Yeah, that's my question. Well, you yeah, would. Yeah, I guess we, we have sprayers that go into the new um, So it's their sole job? Yeah, and they don't, there's no contact. We, we do use yeah. uh, a lot of chlorine, so it's a very wet area. Um, but it's very important that they use it because you are quite the It's very different space there. They usually just wear um, yeah, mask goggles. Yeah, face shield. And, and then when they remove that, there shouldn't be as much risk as the person they're assisting anyway. With the spraying of the bleach, as you said, it takes 10 minutes to work, so does that mean you have to spray and then wait 10 minutes before you can take it off? Or does it not it's it's not it's killing it completely, it's reducing, it. reducing the level. So and then while they're yeah. sprayed, they probably should yeah. tell me if, um, if, if you can butt in, but they should be then checking for any breaks during that yeah. period of time. Um, <coughs> sure, we've never we've had one or two like, breaches, the suits are actually good. Quality. Um, but yeah, absolutely minimizing the risk. You are in a, uh, you're in a bit of a hurry to get stuff off the other end. Um, even if you stay in for an hour, you might, but obviously you can't rush it. Um, so it's a balance between being good at it and following what you're told. Okay, so this is. Um this is explaining exactly what we were talking about, the, the spray, and this is what they look like in Africa, and of course they would uh, be unlikely to spray you in Australia or America. Okay, so laundry. Um, CDC recommend not to launder, um, but if you do need to launder uh, linen, although there might not be any linen, um, do you, did you have linen? Yeah, yeah. yeah, we do a laundry in the park. Okay. So you have to scrape off the feces or whatever there is on it, vomitous feces. Um, you don't ever hold the laundry against your body at all. You keep it at a, at a distance. You put it in a, a leak-proof bag and you take it to be washed with detergent and water and rinse. So you do that first. You do a clean first, then you do a disinfectant with uh, 0 0.05 chlorine for 30 minutes and then dry. 
please interject. Yeah, yeah, we dispose of anything that's overly sorted. Yeah. Okay, so um, if you don't have a washing machine on power, TDC do not like the idea of you doing the washing by hand, but if you uh, insist or you have to, um, they suggest that you, of course, use a, a stick um, to, to move it around, try not to splash at all. The, uh, yeah, so you took the, that's very, she's so hard, she's put her glasses up the top and that's very risky. When I've been working with people who have got AIDS and dying up in Papua New Guinea, what they actually did there is in a smaller bucket, not a big open one, they actually had like a drain plunger which they actually used and it really cleaned things better than anything but your eyes were a long way from it. So they just used use that and it worked very well with the people who in the last stages of AIDS and who were, you know, needed that done. It worked very, very well. So they should wear rubber gloves um, and on removal they should uh, hand hygiene. So any objects that are contaminated uh, in the patient's room with blood or excrement or vomit uh, should be cleaned up as fast as possible. And um, then if it's in a container, then you should be removing the bulk of it and then putting bleach on it. Now they say put bleach on it and cover it and then uh, discard it, but that's not going to do anything through the protein. It's not going to help at all. So get rid of the majority of it into the latrine and then uh, rinse uh, the container, wash with soap and water and discard that down the latrine <coughs> and then bleach it in 0.5%. If it's on the floor, <coughs> don't spray it. Um, bend your knees, pour the bleach onto it very gently, cover it completely, let it stand for 15 minutes and then remove with paper towels and discard this as infectious and hazardous waste and then wash the area with soap and water. Hey, a question. Patient in hospital using a toilet, what should we do? There's still a lot of discussion going that um, New South Wales Health is having a discussion. They've actually bought a lot of pans and the disposable ones, but they're talking about yeah, disposable pans. Wow. Yeah, yeah, and urinals. Um, made out of a paper, a carbon one, they exist, mm. but they're having discussions with the waste people and water boards and they've, they're officially happening at a higher level, so we yeah, have to we watch that space. Recently, which is a referral centre. Yeah. But that's, that's not sorted yet. No, it, they're still working with the um, sanitation people and all that for that, so but it's in progress. It. <laughs> no, there's no rule, ruling on no, that one yet. There, there certainly was a lot of talk in America about it and the infectious disease physicians decided that it was okay. Um, but yeah. then the sewerage people thought it was it's not okay. Yeah. Yes, so uh, the decisions are still pending. So it's with the authorities <coughs> here still. Okay, so now I'm going to just move into quickly um, the, uh, we've talked very uh, extensively about removing uh, your PPE and this anti-room should be preferably attached to the room when you're looking after the patient but it is a separate one. Uh, alternatively, they say you could do it in the patient's room by taking just a few items off um, and you need uh, somebody to help you and you need to be able to hear them so that they can advise you as you're going through just a few. Or develop the hallway and during SARS, um, the hospital that I assisted to look at why healthcare workers were getting SARS had dedicated the whole foyer but had demarcated where there was the clean zone and where there was the dirty zone. Uh, so if you're going to do that, then you have to be very careful to reduce the number of staff going through uh, and uh, still comply with fire codes. Uh, so restrict access and make sure that uh, when you're coming out, the dirt, you don't uh, contaminate the clean area where you're going to don your gear. So you have to, it has to have a hand hygiene facility. Uh, facility. Has to, has to. Uh, leak proof uh, wastage and uh, an area where you can uh, disinfect your PPE, <coughs> wipe it over and then uh, discard it. Um, we'll just move to that. Okay, single room, Katarina's mentioned closed door and that's because you don't want the virus to go into the hall and contaminate other people and that's why you want to reduce uh, access to the hall. You can of course in Hong Kong, um, every room uh, was made into a negative air pressure room by getting uh, those um, HEPA filters on, uh, on legs and you can wander them in. 
Um, okay, so remember, you, you as the healthcare worker have to decontaminate the uh, care environment regularly, even if it looks clean. So you're now becoming an expert in cleaning. So you have to regularly clean and disinfect, even if it doesn't look visibly contaminated. And, and by the way, when somebody uh, takes their gear off in an anti-room, it has to be cleaned immediately, okay? So uh, if the patient has a spill, it has to be cleaned immediately. If the room <coughs> is clean, you have to clean it on a regular basis. Um, and uh, it's only going to be cleaned by the nurse and the physician. Uh, that's the recommendation, certainly in America. So be very mindful of high touch surfaces and particularly um, horizontal surfaces and uh, as they call them, housekeeping surfaces, floors. Uh, before you disinfect anything, it has to be cleaned. Um, Margie, would you like to tell them about the cleaning method? A disinfectant doesn't work if there's a lot of protein. It has to be a two-step process. You clean it first and then disinfect it for most things. So, um, you, yeah, before you, you just can't pour bleach on or the clothes or the bed, you'd have to clean it first, then disinfect it with whatever you're choosing to do. There are a couple of chemicals around now that are, have the two, two in one, but there's not many of them. Most of our, um, many of our products, if you look around the hospital, are disinfectant or disinfectant only. And it doesn't work if there's a lot of protein there. It, it just can't break that much down. So you have to clean it first, like your hands as well. And then you put a, you know, if you had, blood or body substance on your hand, you couldn't just use an alcohol. You have to wash it off first. So what you might do is use wipes or a, a cloth that you can throw away as well. Uh, and then, oh, now you're going to ask me, I know someone's going to ask me, why would you use an EPA that is uh, good for a non-envelope um, uh, virus? Why? Because non-envelope viruses are really difficult um, to, to clean. They can become quite resistant with disinfectant. So if this works with the non-envelope, then it's going to work with the boulder, which is envelope. Okay, I have to go through this really quickly because um, Ryan is going to tell me to stop talking in a moment. So everything has to be disposable and has to go into a leak-proof and rigid area. And just to remind you of the steps that... Oh, steps that Margie has mentioned. So you wipe the area with a neutral detergent uh, and <coughs> then you disinfect it with a 0.5 chlorine in Africa or an EPA, a hospital grade disinfectant. And then guess what? You do it all over again. You have to do it twice, okay? And you're gonna do it, not the cleaner. Okay, so uh, if there's a spill, you have to debulk it. That's the new word for, for the century, debulk it by removing most of it away into a, um, using a, a cloth, a disposable cloth, and uh, don't spray, and put it into a leak-proof uh, container. Uh, leave for 15 minutes once you put the uh, EPA fluid on it, at least 15 minutes, and then you wipe it away and wash with soap and water. Okay, um, same thing. All right, uh, linen, I never carry it again. Uh, so this is in Australia, or we've learned about what to do in, the, uh, in Africa. Same thing, we need to move it promptly to an area in it that is a hazard bin, uh, because it is now considered by CDC as hazard. Anything, anything that you use on your patient during patient care, um, including sheets, etc., and, and pieces that you've wiped up off the floor is now considered hazardous material. Uh, and uh, to reduce any uh, exposure, CDC is recommending that you immediately dispose of it and perhaps this should be incineration. And as Brian has mentioned to you, the problems of finding a group that will incinerate. This slide is available to you and it talks to you about the US um, uh, approval of on-site uh, inactivation and incineration. And these are our um, references, um, WHO, CDC, and uh, um, Medicines Sans Frontier. Thank you very much. Thank you.